This is number 11 in international human rights. I'll call this human rights, power politics, and the culture wars that we're living with. I have mentioned earlier that the issue of power politics and power is often very important and elements of postmodern thought of what we call cultural Marxism. I've touched on in the world of larger power politics, how often many states are hesitant to critique, for example, China, given its obvious human rights violations with Tibetans, human rights activists, Christians in China, Muslims in China, human rights activists, Tiananmen Square. In the balancing of power politics and realpolitik, People can hold high the notion of human rights, but often when push comes to shove, when they're dealing with a major power, there's not a lot they're going to do. It's the same thing with Saudi Arabia, given the significant role it plays with oil, its distribution of oil in the West. Most of the first world, they'll wrap the Saudi fingers briefly, but in the process, they're not going to say a lot about Saudi Arabia and what's going on in Yemen, light armor vehicles being sent there, uh, Russia, Putin. We could move around the world here in terms of larger power politics. And when power and human rights collide, or when economics collide with human rights, often human rights take a secondary or a tertiary role in that debate and so but to move forward um, away from those larger issues of major powers and human rights the issue of power is quite interesting because when we move in the direction of the culture wars in human rights which i'd like to briefly discuss within the postmodern ideal of foucault and derrida and others like this their argument is that at the heart some of the major tensions is power imbalances between major groups and you have the powerful and you have the powerless and he or she who has the power often uses it unjustly and it's the role of the powerless to overthrow the powerful the dilemma of course is often those who were once powerless when they get powerful they often then duplicate the very thing that was done to them and so powerless becomes power, then you just use power to create another powerless group of people. But power becomes a key term in the language of the culture wars we're living with today, with cultural Marxism, um, obviously economic Marxism, the dualism is bourgeois who have the power, proletariat or powerlessness. As the proletariat gradually get power, they overthrow the bourgeois and so you get this reversal. The epistemology stays much the same for Marx. The hope was eventually there would be the withering away of the tension and you'd have the classless society. Now, postmodern thought draws from that power powerlessness, which is not new to Marx. It has a long, long history in the Western civilization. But culture Marxism uses, the again, this notion of power powerlessness and so I want to look at a variety of issues where we see this played out and how do human rights factor into it? And if you raise questions about power, how is a person likely to be treated? Noam Chomsky is a key figure as a Jewish person, thinker. I had long correspondence with Noam Chomsky when I was on staff with Amnesty International. Um, he is a Jew, it's assumed as a Jew, given the history of Jews, the Holocaust, that he would be a supporter of the emergence of Zionism, as many Jews are. But Chomsky, as a young man who went to Israel, as many were expected to in the 50s after Israel became a state in 48, to work on kibbutz, and the kibbutz were seen as communal communities in which they would... Uh, work together for the thriving and the growth of Israel. The problem with that is Chomsky came to see very clearly that the kibbutzes were fronts that led to the oppression of Palestinians. And so Chomsky, when he returns to the United States in the 50s and the 1960s, he becomes one of the key, 
key critics, not only of the United States and its foreign policy, but the close relationship to the United States and Israel and the impact on the Palestinians. So here you have a situation which seems to be powerful, well, initially powerless Jews, Zionism power, powerless Palestinians. So those who were once powerless become powerful, and then you have another powerless class in that sense and so uh, now the dilemma of course is when we think of human rights in situations like this do all jews think the same and are all palestinians the same in terms of their understanding of issues edward said was a very good friend of young chomsky he was a palestinian and so when we get into the culture wars the danger of following say the model of economic marxism of bourgeois proletariat or cultural Marxism, power powerless, it makes us, it look as if a powerless class is homogenous and an oppressor class is homogenous. And in the Jewish-Palestinian issue, Edward Said, being himself Palestinian, he would dare to critique uh, Yasser Arafat, elements of the PLO, uh, Hamas, and groups like this. And so the danger when a person has a model of a simplistic model of homogenous classes, um, then you're either Palestinian, in this case, or Jewish, uh, and uh, is reality that simple? Are all Palestinians, do they all think one way? Well, obviously, Edward Said and his engagement with the PLO, you have tensions within the Palestinians of how the oppressed are to move towards liberation and is their move, will that lead to another form of oppression itself? And within the Jewish community, um, there were many, I mentioned Martin Buber, um, nor Noam Chomsky, what seem to be the oppressor class are complex as well. There's tensions within them. So the point I'm wanting to make here is and when we move into the culture wars, there's always the danger of reducing the discussion to classes, to gender, to race, to ethnicity, on which one group are homogenous and the other group, which is the oppressor or the oppressed, is homogenous as well. And so I'll just look at a, a few issues in this case in the dilemma it raises for human rights. Uh, when we think of, say, feminism and the whole movement from Mary Wollstonecraft forward in terms of the rights of women and the importance, role of women, many who had been oppressed and marginalized and were expected to play certain gender roles within the family. Um, and as the whole movement in terms of rights for women has moved along, are, do all forms of feminism uh, think the same? Are there tensions within feminism itself? What's the difference between first generation feminism, uh, the rise of black feminism, First Nations feminism, Marxist feminism, um, gay feminism? Uh, there are immense tensions within the feminist movement. There are right wing forms of feminism, centrist forms of feminism, and there are left wing forms of feminism. When we think of activism itself in terms of overcoming injustice, is protest politics in the street politics the best way to be active? Is advocacy politics the best way to be active? Or is formal politics the best way to guarantee human rights? This is, this is exploring the issue from within how does one act on certain understandings of what is seen as injustices or issues that have to be dealt with. Black Lives Matter in the summer of 2020. Um, do all blacks think the same? Do all interpret their history exactly the same? Are there blacks who are Republicans, blacks who are Democrats? Well, of course there are. So often the danger of saying that blacks have been oppressed and all blacks, the question is who speaks and who is speaking when they're articulating a black position and who is being marginalized, who is being ignored in this particular discussion. So the danger for human rights when one moves into justice concerns is that who is given the leadership or the spokesperson, but who is being silenced within a community? 
can be the feminist movement. Uh, who, who's given the voice and who is being silenced? And then, of course, people get the idea that there's only a certain form of feminism or black justice. Um, let's look at indigenous traditions. Are, do all, say in Canada, do all First Nations people think the same? Is the, you know, are the Iroquois or the Huron in the history of Canada, do they all think the same? Well, fence immense clashes out um, on the West Coast and throughout Canada, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, the Haida, the Stalo. Um, do all of these different groups, are they, are they homogenous? And who within each group is the spokesperson that gets the media attention, who does not get the media attention? Uh, because often he or she who gets the media attention seems to be the voice of a particular community, and yet there are other voices within any community which are often silenced or marginalized or sidelined. And so the public gets the image of a certain portrayal or perspective of a group that often distorts the more complex reality because no group, as I mentioned earlier, is homogenous. This can be played out in British Columbia last year with the pipeline debate. Were all First Nations contra the pipeline? Well, of course not. There were some who were, and there were many other bands that were for the pipeline. Now, if one defines authentic form of Aboriginal spirituality and politics is contra pipeline sensitivity to the earth and those who took the other position were betrayers if you argue that in fact any community whether black feminist first nations are complex communities then who speaks for the community when it collides when there's conflict whose interpretation uh, is to be heard and heeded and how does a government for example and how does your average citizen makes sense of the competing voices within a community that claim to interpret a tradition. I lived for a time with the Sami in northern Norway. They were the forest Sami, the ocean Sami. I lived with the mountain Sami, and this was a period of time when Arnie Nace, one of the great founders of deep ecology, was there working very closely with the Sami. Most would know them, some would know them as the Laplanders, similar to the Inuit in Canada. And there's obviously in Canada huge tensions between First Nations people and the Inuit, just as there were in the Sami in northern Norway, between the Sami of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. But the issue when I was there in the early 70s, who speaks for the Sami? Obviously there were some very ecologically sensitive, opposed to the da damming in some of their areas, um, like Site C in British Columbia right now. Um, there are others were very pro Norwegian society, and so conflicting voices were very, very much at work. Now, this raises problems for human rights in the culture wars on a whole range of issues because if a particular group defines what is authentic black justice, what is authentic First Nations, what is authentic feminism, what is authentic environmentalism, because within the environmental movement you have people on the right, you have the center, you have the Green Party, people in the Liberal Party claim to be interested in green politics. Who speaks for? So is it a David Suzuki or a Wade Davis? What's the difference between them and Elizabeth May or the new leader of the Green Party? Is that uh, the competition for who speaks for a particular movement is an important human rights issue. And what often happens is when one group see themselves as those who define uh, what the group stands for and those who protest and often those who question or ask critical questions of a certain leadership, they're marginalized and they're silenced. So we get often some of these hot button issues in the culture wars on, on how um, black history and black justice and environmental and feminist and Aboriginal and people will raise questions either within a community or people who are outside those communities that raise legitimate critical questions, uh, they're often silenced. And so often what happens is you get certain progressives uh, take issues, they interpret them a certain way, and those who disagree with them, they must be reinforcing a power structure. And so we're back to the power question again. 
And so when people become silenced who wants to raise critical questions, what then that happens is you get reactionaries that move to the right in terms of the free speech movement. And the free speech movement can be, if it's not careful, a justification for very questionable content. It can also be, at its best, asking for critical thinking on ideological positions within certain politically correct organizations. And so when we think of human rights, the danger always, as I mentioned earlier, is where uh, there are no homogenous groups within any traditions or hot button issues in the culture wars. There are complex internal ways of interpreting and certain groups will emerge as the dominant power which subordinate or silence. And then people not in those CUNYs who merely ask critical questions about ways of interpreting history, ways of interpreting present issues, they're often silenced as uh, people who do not belong to those CUNYs, so they have no right to ask questions. That way of thinking then creates the political right. And so when it comes to human rights, if we're ever going to overcome partisan politics, um, tribal politics and deal with human rights in a much more meaningful manner. Um, we have to be very careful uh, if in the ways certain forms of progressives uh, are not responsible for birthing the reactionary right. And then the reactionary right, of course, with its language of free speech, can use the content of that in an abusive manner. But when we begin to silence people, uh, from asking minimally meaningful questions, that certainly undermines the importance of human rights, undermines citizenship, and it creates a free speech movement that in, in and by itself uh, becomes reactionary, uh, that then leads to yet the next stage of polarization in the culture wars. And the language of human rights at its best is, a meant, is an attempt to transcend a certain ideological and narrow way of thinking that leads to polarized politics. And John Milton once said in the Areopagitica, I cannot praise a cloistered virtue that never sallies forth. An ideology can be a form of a cloistered virtue that defines how something is to be interpreted and those who differ with it become uh, non-orthodox, they become heterodox or heretics, and so you just have a new form of secularized religion in which there's the orthodox reads of a position, those who differ are heterodox and um, heretical to the tribe, and what that does, of course, in the midst of the culture wars, in the name of holding high human rights, it in fact undermines human rights. So, um, human rights Power politics, one has to be careful how power is used because those who often are new to power, uh, who once felt oppressed, can then oppress those who they feel once oppressed them. And so power is always a very ambiguous thing. It can be used crudely, it can be used subtly, but if it's not understood properly, it perpetuates the culture wars we live in and paralyzes one and all from moving forward into mature citizenship and, and um, what human rights are meant to be, ideally.